Welcome to part one of the ultimate true crime iceberg, where we explore all forms of true crime cases with a particular focus on crimes where the victims paid the ultimate price. The slaying of Michelle Lee. The case of Michelle Lee, a 26 year old nursing student from Hayward, California, captured public attention when she disappeared on May 27, 2011. Michelle grew up in San Diego, part of a close-knit Vietnamese family, consisting of her mom, dad, and brother. Unfortunately, her mother passed away in 1999 after a multi-year battle with breast cancer. After graduating from high school, she pursued higher education, first at San Jose State University, before moving to Samuel Merritt University in Oakland, California for nursing. Michelle was last seen at the Kaiser Permanente Medical Center, a facility associated with the university where she was studying nursing. The following morning, her vehicle, a white Honda SUV, was discovered parked nearby with signs of distress inside. Despite no immediate leads, her family initiated extensive search efforts leveraging billboards and rewards for any information related to her whereabouts. The investigation intensified over the following months. Police initially suspected that the incident involved someone close to Michelle due to the nature of the case. This suspicion led to the arrest of Giselle Esteban, a former high school friend of Michelle, on September 7, 2011. Despite Michelle's body not being found at that time, evidence was substantial. Bloodstains found in Michelle's vehicle matched those on Esteban's shoes, and security footage placed Esteban in the vicinity at the time of Michelle's disappearance. Further damning evidence arose from the tracking of cell phone movements, showing Esteban and Michelle's phones moving in tandem across Alameda County after Michelle's disappearance. The motive behind this tragic event was rooted in jealousy and perceived betrayal. Esteban harbored a belief that Michelle had interfered in her relationship with Scott Morassigan, with whom Esteban shared a child. Despite their relationship having ended years prior, Esteban's inability to move past her connection with Morassigan led to a growing resentment towards Michelle. This culminated in a meticulously planned attack, as Esteban tracked Michelle's movements and planned the confrontation in the parking area of the medical center. And to be clear, Esteban's belief was not rooted in reality whatsoever. Michelle had not had any relationship with Esteban's ex-boyfriend. More on this when we discuss the trial. On September 17, 2011, Nearly four months after Michelle's disappearance, her remains were discovered in a remote canyon area, significantly decomposed, making the determination of the exact cause of death challenging. However, the accumulation of circumstantial and direct evidence was sufficient for law enforcement and the judicial system, and she was charged. The trial of Giselle Esteban was marked by dramatic revelations and a clear display of the consequences of unchecked jealousy and misguided beliefs. Prosecutors contended that Esteban was driven by a mistaken belief that Michelle was romantically involved with Scott Morassigan. Their theory, which was proven at trial, was that this led to confrontation and Michelle's slaying. Esteban's defense acknowledged that their client was responsible for Michelle's demise but argued for a lesser conviction of voluntary manslaughter. They suggested that Michelle had provoked Esteban into acting in a moment of uncontrollable passion. However, the prosecution presented a strong case, illustrating that Esteban had been planning her actions for months. This included stalking Michelle at her workplace and generally tracking her movements. During the sentencing, Alameda County Superior Court Judge John Rolofson highlighted Esteban's apparent lack of remorse for her actions. He pointed out that throughout the proceedings, Esteban showed no sign of regret or understanding of the gravity of her actions. Ultimately, Esteban was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison, reflecting the severity of her actions 
and the irrevocable loss she inflicted on Michelle and her family. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, was a notorious figure whose criminal activities terrorized California residents from 1984 to 1985. Born on February 29, 1960, in El Paso, Texas, Ramirez had a troubled upbringing, marked by exposure to graphic violence and substance abuse. His cousin, a Vietnam War veteran, introduced him to drugs and shared disturbing stories and images from the war, which Ramirez found fascinating rather than horrifying. This cousin, a decorated Green Beret, had secretly taken to committing illicit non-consensual acts against the local Vietnamese woman and then brutally slaying them. And if that wasn't enough, Ramirez witnessed his cousin slay his wife in front of him. These early experiences, combined with a burgeoning interest in Satanism and criminal behavior generally, shaped the horrific path Ramirez would follow. If you've watched my other Iceberg series on unsolved mysteries, you know that Satanism and the Satanic Panic often come up. And in the 1980s, it seems that every crime had a theory about a potential Satanic tie-in. Well, that wasn't the case here. All evidence suggests that Richard Ramirez was a legitimate and unironic Satanist. But I'll get into that in a moment. Ramirez was not academically inclined or well-guided and dropped out of school in the ninth grade. Prior to moving to California, he worked at a Holiday Inn, where he initially started using his access to rooms to rob patrons. Unfortunately, this isn't where he stopped, and his actions at this Holiday Inn became extremely depraved. I won't go into the full details, but let's just say he would commit illicit assaults, regardless of age, foreshadowing his future behavior. For reasons which aren't clear to me, despite committing these unnatural acts, no charges were pressed against him. Ramirez moved to California in 1982, where he continued his extremely heinous activities. His first known act as part of the Night Stalker serial slayings occurred in April 1984, with a brutal and fatal attack on a nine-year-old in San Francisco. Notably, this case was not tied to the Night Stalker serial slayings until decades later. It wasn't until the ending of 79-year-old Jenny Vinso in June 1984 that the quote, official spree began. Ramirez's reign of terror over California would last for just over a year, with over 15 victims falling to his acts. Throughout his reign of terror, Ramirez displayed no clear pattern in choosing his victims, which ranged in age, gender, and location, adding to the public's fear. He committed his crimes predominantly at night, breaking into homes to assault and brutalize the inhabitants. His actions were characterized by exceptional brutality, and he often left satanic symbols at the crime scenes, further heightening the public's fear and the media frenzy. The intense media coverage and public fear led to a massive law enforcement effort to capture Ramirez. The breakthrough in the case came from forensic evidence. Ramirez left behind crucial fingerprints at a crime scene, which, combined with eyewitness accounts, led to his identification. In late August 1985, Ramirez was the top story across California news outlets. However, he was completely oblivious to this. Despite the manhunt on for him, he unknowingly evaded the cops by getting aboard a bus for Tucson, Arizona to spend some time with his brother. However, when he arrived in Tucson, his brother wasn't there, and being none the wiser to the manhunt, decided to return to Los Angeles. On August 30, 1985, Richard Ramirez returned to Los Angeles from the failed visit to his brother, bypassing police at the bus terminal. How did he give police the slip? Well, he didn't do it intentionally, but they were only checking for outbound buses. Unsurprisingly, the authorities didn't think Ramirez would be trying to enter LA in East Los Angeles, a very heavily Hispanic part of the city, 
He realized his identity was exposed when he noticed people in a store screaming and recognizing him as, quote, El Matador from the news. Quick aside, this name might be associated with bullfighters in English. However, in Spanish, the name just means killer. Panic-stricken, Ramirez fled, resulting in a chaotic sequence and an attempted carjacking. Local residents intervened and detained him after a chase. The police were alerted and arrived to arrest the severely beaten Ramirez. In 1989, Ramirez was convicted of 13 counts of ending lives, five attempted endings of lives, 11 illicit assaults, and 14 burglaries. He was sentenced to face the death penalty in California's gas chamber, to which he responded with indifference. Despite his apparent indifference, he launched an endless series of appeals to delay the ending of his life. He died of natural causes in 2013, never having faced the execution that was ordered for his crimes. Also, in a bizarre postscript to this story, Ramirez married Doreen Leoy, an editor for the once-renowned magazine for teen girls, Tiger Beat. Amy Harwick, Amy Nicole Harwick, born on May 20th, 1981, was an influential figure whose life and career left a lasting impact on many. Harwick dedicated her life to helping others navigate the complexities of relationships and intimate affairs. Her journey into the field of psychology was marked by determination and hard work, including her time as a playboy model and dance performer to fund her education. Harwick eventually earned her PhD and specialized in family and, quote, intimate health counseling, making regular appearances on various media platforms to share her insights. In 2014, she released a best-selling book on intimate health for women. Harwick's personal life also garnered public attention, particularly her engagement to comedian Drew Carey, which was announced in 2018 but amicably ended later that year. The events leading to Harwick's tragic passing on February 15, 2020, unfolded under horrifying circumstances. Harwick was discovered in a critical condition beneath the balcony of her Los Angeles home, leading to her death in the hospital. The investigation revealed a struggle had taken place, with Harwick suffering from injuries consistent with a fall from a height, further compounded by blunt force injuries to her head and torso. These injuries were later confirmed by the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner's Office to have contributed to her death, which was officially ruled a homicide. Gareth Pursehouse, Harwick's ex-boyfriend, became the central figure in the subsequent legal proceedings. Harwick had previously sought protection against Pursehouse, with two restraining orders filed against him in the years leading up to her death. Despite these measures, the threat Pursehouse posed remained, culminating in his arrest and charge for the events leading to Harwick's death. His trial began in August 2023, and by September, Pursehouse was convicted, with a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole handed down in December of the same year. Lake Bodum slayings. In the early hours of June 5, 1960, a chilling event unfolded at Lake Bodum, near Espo, Finland. Four teenagers, Myla Irmeli Bjorklund, Anja Maki, Seppo Antero Boisman, and Niels Wilhelm Gustafsson, embarked on a camping trip that ended tragically. The group set up their tent along the tranquil shores of Lake Bodum, expecting a night of camaraderie and outdoor adventure. However, their peaceful retreat turned into a nightmare when, between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m., an assailant attacked, resulting in the deaths of Bjorklund, Maki, and Boisman. They were subjected to a brutal assault involving stabbing and bludgeoning, while Gustafsson, the sole survivor, was found with serious injuries and fractured facial bones. Early reports suggested a sighting of a mysterious figure described as a blonde man, seen leaving the campsite around the time of the incident. The crime scene, discovered by a passerby later that morning, revealed a disturbing scene. The victim's tent collapsed, with evidence of the violence that had occurred spilling out onto the lakeshore. 
The investigation into the incident was marred by significant oversights from the outset. Critical errors, such as the failure to secure the crime scene promptly and the mishandling of potential evidence, hampered the police's efforts to identify the perpetrator. The mysterious nature of the crime, combined with these investigative missteps, led to widespread speculation and numerous theories about the identity of the assailant. Over the years, several suspects have emerged, each with their own compelling, yet ultimately inconclusive connections to the case. Among them were Carl Valdemar Gilstrom, a local kiosk owner known for his animosity towards campers. Yes, you heard me right, the guy who sold goods to tourists at the camp had a deep hatred for campers. Talk about choosing the wrong profession. Another suspect was Hans Asman, who exhibited suspicious behavior and was seen with blood-stained clothes shortly after the incident. And quick aside on Asman, this individual was a person of interest in five other slayings and confessed to at least one on his deathbed. Despite various leads and extensive investigations, no conclusive evidence was found to definitively link any suspect to the crime. In a twist over four decades later, the lone survivor, Gustafsson was arrested and charged with the slayings based on allegedly conclusive forensic evidence. Gustafsson had never been named as a suspect or even a person of interest. The prosecution suggested that a drunken altercation between Gustafsson and his friends led to the tragic events. The forensic evidence against Gustafsson centered around several key pieces of evidence that, according to the prosecution's theory of the case, implicated him in the tragic events of 1960. According to the prosecution, one of the most compelling pieces of evidence was the discovery of the victim's blood on Gustafsson's shoes. Additionally, the prosecution claimed that these shoes were found hidden away from the crime scene, suggesting a possible attempt to conceal his involvement. Another piece of evidence that the prosecutors claimed worked against Gustafsson was the nature and extent of his injuries compared to those of the deceased. Prosecutors argued that the pattern of Gustafsson's injuries could suggest a scenario in which he engaged in a confrontation with his friends leading to a deadly escalation. According to their theory of the case, the absence of Gustafsson's blood on the shoes was also seen as significant, suggesting that his injuries occurred after the murders were committed, possibly in an attempt to fabricate a narrative of being another victim. Despite this evidence, the court ultimately found it insufficient for a conviction. The acquittal was based on several factors, Firstly, the forensic evidence, while suggestive, was not conclusive. It could not irrefutably prove Gustafson's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution's interpretation of the bloodstains and injury patterns was challenged by the defense, which argued that the evidence could be interpreted in multiple ways. Additionally, the defense highlighted the significant time gap between the incident and Gustafson's trial. They suggested that the forensic analysis could be flawed or incomplete due to the degradation of evidence over time. The court also considered the lack of a clear motive and the possibility of external involvement. This was amplified given the complexities of the case and the initial mishandling of the crime scene, which could have compromised the forensic evidence relied upon. Ultimately, the court decided that the evidence presented did not meet the stringent standards required for a criminal conviction, leading to Gustafson's acquittal. In my view, the trial against Gustafson, over four decades after the Lake Bodum incident, raised significant concerns about the fairness and viability of pursuing a conviction. One critical argument against proceeding with the trial was the extensive time lapse between the incident in 1960 and the trial in 2005. Over such a long period, evidence can degrade, witness memories fade, and the integrity of forensic analysis can be compromised, making it challenging to establish facts with the required level of certainty for a criminal conviction. 
Moreover, the initial investigation's mishandling, including the failure to secure the crime scene and the loss or contamination of potential evidence, further undermined the reliability of any evidence presented decades later. Additionally, the absence of new, unequivocal evidence against Gustafsson and the speculative nature of the forensic analysis presented by the prosecution highlighted the speculative basis for the charges. Without a clear motive, definitive physical evidence directly linking Gustafsson to the crime or new witness testimony, the trial appeared to some as an attempt to close the case rather than a pursuit of truth based on solid evidence. This combination of factors suggests that the trial against Gustafsson may have been more about seeking closure for a case that has rightfully embarrassed Finnish police. As a result of what I would call a miscarriage of justice against Gustafsson, he was awarded 45,000 euros for this ordeal, which was paid to him by Finland. Jimmy here, the dude behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please do me a huge favor and hit the like and subscribe buttons and that sweet notification bell. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership, joining the Patreon, and joining the Discord. Bella Kiss. Bella Kiss was a Hungarian serial slayer, born in 1877, who gained notoriety for the gruesome discovery of over 20 bodies hidden in metal drums on his property in a suburb of Budapest after his disappearance in 1916. Before his crimes came to light, Kiss lived as a tinsmith, presenting himself as a respectable, though solitary figure in the community. Around 1912, Kiss began placing advertisements in newspapers seeking lonely women, seeking a fortune teller to improve their love lives, or seeking financial assistance. His screening process seemed to focus entirely on women who were either financially destitute or had no one to miss them if they went missing. This is a common tactic amongst these predators, and it allows for them to continue their heinous acts for longer. It is during this period that he committed his slayings, deceiving, and then ending his victims, whose bodies he preserved in alcohol within sealed metal drums stored on his property. Kiss was called up for service in World War I in 1914. In 1916, during a planned renovation of Bela Kiss's rented property, the landlord discovered seven sealed tin drums containing the bodies of female victims. The authorities were called initiating a horrifying investigation that would reveal the full horror of Bella's activities. Kiss, having joined the war effort in 1914, was absent, leading to speculation about his whereabouts. The authorities discovered a total of 24 bodies at Kiss's residence, revealing a gruesome pattern of serial killings. Investigators discovered books on poisons and strangulation along with the victim's bodies preserved in alcohol and drained of blood, suggesting that Kiss might have practiced vampirism. Efforts to capture Kiss were complicated by his common name and the uncertainty of his status as possibly deceased or a prisoner of war. Over the years, there were numerous sightings of him across the world, including in the Turkish army, in Serbia, and in New York City, but none were confirmed. The Hungarian police and later law enforcement officials in various jurisdictions pursued leads without success. The mystery of his final whereabouts and fate remains unsolved, adding to the infamy of his crimes. My hypothesis on this one is that Belikis likely saw or heard of a newspaper report describing his crimes while he was on the front and deserted at that point leaving behind his old identity. Supporting this hypothesis, an individual in the French Foreign Legion was identified as potentially being Kiss. However, this individual deserted the Legion prior to investigation and was never found. That said, the French Foreign Legion, especially at that time, was full of suspect people who may need to desert at a moment's notice. Alternatively, two years passed between Bela Kiss's enlistment in the Austro-Hungarian army and the finding of the corpses. 
These were, to put it mildly, not easy years to be on the front, and it's very possible that he perished on the field of battle, contracted a fatal disease, or died in a prisoner of war camp, the slaying of Brenda Thurman. In January 2016, the case of Brenda Thurman's death in Spokane Valley garnered significant media attention. Initially classified as accidental by the Spokane County Medical Examiner, her husband, Dwayne Thurman, a former Lincoln County Reserve Deputy, stated he was cleaning his wife's firearm when it discharged, leading to her fatal injury. Dwayne was subsequently charged with first-degree manslaughter, but a jury found him guilty of second-degree manslaughter instead. He was sentenced to five years in prison in relation to this charge. I note that it is important to remember that second-degree manslaughter generally covers situations where someone acts recklessly in a way that they know could cause death. However, they do not actually intend to cause death, and as such the penalty associated is much less than for the intentional slaying. The incident has been fraught with complexities and differing perspectives, particularly from the family of Brenda Thurman. Brenda's children, Gabrielle and Michael, provided accounts that cast doubt on the accidental nature of the shooting. Gabrielle, present in the house during the incident, recounted rushing downstairs upon hearing the gunshot and finding her stepfather with her mother, expressing regret. She questioned Duane's immediate actions post-incident, highlighting a lack of emergency response measures consistent with their military background. The Thurman family, including Brenda, had a history in military service, which magnified questions around the handling of firearms and emergency procedures. In 2022, the Spokane County Medical Examiner reclassified Brenda's death from accidental to homicide. However, the conviction and sentencing of Dwayne Thurman to five years for second-degree manslaughter had already occurred. Legal limitations related to double jeopardy prevent further criminal charges against him in connection to Brenda's death. As such, despite this reclassification, the case cannot be revisited. Hitoshi Igarashi. In 1991, the literary world was shaken by the tragic slaying of Hitoshi Igarashi, a Japanese scholar and translator of Salman Rushdie's controversial novel, The Satanic Verses. Born on June 10, 1947, Igarashi was a respected figure in the field of Arabic and Persian literature and history. His career saw him translating notable works and teaching comparative Islamic culture at a respected university in Japan. Igarashi's work on the Satanic Verses placed him at the heart of a global controversy. The novel, published in 1988, was accused of blasphemy against Islam, leading Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini of Iran to issue a fatwa in 1989, calling for the slaying of its author and those associated with its publication. This declaration set off a series of violent reactions against individuals linked to the book, culminating in Igarashi's untimely death. In 1990, while Igarashi was giving a talk about his translation of the book, he was assaulted while on stage. On July 11, 1991, Igarashi was found deceased in his office at his university, with wounds inflicted by an assailant who remains unidentified to this day. The motives behind this act have been widely speculated upon, with connections drawn to his translation of Rushdie's work. The widely believed assumption is that this case was related to his translation of the Satanic Verses. However, the evidence for this is solely circumstantial at this time. That said, circumstantial evidence does not mean bad evidence, and circumstantial evidence can be extremely strong depending on the circumstances. However, it is of course entirely possible that someone with a personal grudge against Igarashi used the controversy over his translation of the Satanic Verses as a smokescreen to end him. This hypothesis is just pure guesswork with absolutely no evidence whatsoever to support it. The police have neither named any suspects nor named any persons of interest in the case. Despite the passage of time, 
the case remains unsolved, and the statute of limitations on the case expired in 2006 without any resolution. As an aside, I note that Japan has now abolished the statute of limitations for capital offenses. However, this does not apply retroactively, and the individual responsible for the slaying is free to come forth today, the Bigfoot killer. From February to October 1975, a harrowing series of crimes unfolded that would leave an indelible mark on Detroit. The perpetrator, dubbed the Bigfoot killer, an unidentified assailant, embarked on a brutal campaign of violence, targeting young women engaged in paid companionship. This serial killer, whose moniker was derived from his notably large feet, was responsible for the essay and slaying of seven victims, their ages ranging from 16 to 22 years. The Bigfoot killer's modus operandi was chillingly methodical. He preyed upon vulnerable women, luring them with the promise of money in exchange for services. Once they were in his grasp, he would resort to violence, wielding a knife to intimidate and control his victims before committing unspeakable acts and finally, strangulation. Witnesses and surviving victims described the perpetrator as a muscular, tall African-American man, aged between 30 and 35, with distinctive facial hair and an afro. The investigation into these heinous crimes was fraught with challenges. A key suspect emerged in January 1976 when Carl Mayweather Jr., a 29-year-old Detroit man was arrested during an attempted crime against a woman. Mayweather had a prior record of assault and seemed to fit the physical description of the Bigfoot killer. Despite these initial suspicions, Mayweather was ultimately cleared of involvement in the Bigfoot killings, as he had solid alibis for virtually all of the slayings. Further given that all the endings were committed by the same person, his solid alibis for most but not all slayings was sufficient. The community's response to the killings was one of outrage and desperation. Activists and residents, frustrated with what they perceived as police negligence, organized rallies demanding action and accountability. Their criticisms centered on the authorities' reluctance to acknowledge the severity of the situation and their failure to protect the community's most vulnerable members. Further, they criticized the extreme lack of resources which were assigned to the case, despite the severity of the ongoing attacks and the danger posed to some of the most vulnerable in the community. Unfortunately, despite attempts by the community, this case went cold, and it doesn't appear that it is being actively investigated in any meaningful way. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Remember to leave a comment below if there's a case that you want me to cover on this series. Also, once again, if you enjoy my content, please consider donating via Patreon or signing up for a YouTube membership. The topics I cover can lead to demonetization of my videos, and with your support, I can be less bound by self-censorship. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, and Jeffer Metcalf. Also, big shout out to YouTube member Jordan All. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out. Welcome to Volume 2 of the Disturbing True Crime Iceberg series. Now without further delay, let's get on to the cases. The Pharmacy Maniac. In 2011, Chelyabinsk, Russia, became the backdrop for a chilling series of crimes by an individual dubbed the Pharmacy Maniac. This unidentified assailant targeted two pharmacies within the city, leading to the loss of two lives under harrowing circumstances. The first incident occurred in May, inside a pharmacy where the perpetrator, masked and armed, demanded money from the people present. This incident resulted in the ending of a 49-year-old man named Vladimir Shin, who had walked in to purchase medicine. A few months later in August, a second attack unfolded in a similar fashion, 
claiming the life of 30-year-old Igor Ustinov. This time, the attacker shot Ustinov upon entering, and after a brief exit to reload his weapon, returned to ensure Ustinov was deceased. The killer's modus operandi involved the use of a sawn-off shotgun and attacks exclusively on classic brand pharmacies, a popular chain in Russia. Witnesses described the assailant as extremely unusual in appearance and odd in demeanor. Further, adding to the mystery, he used Russian phrases generally used by American soldiers in Russian films. Despite intensive investigations, which included the distribution of a facial composite and a large financial reward for information leading to his capture, the pharmacy maniac remains at large. The perpetrator's motive remains unknown, though he did engage in robberies. However, the robberies were for nominal sums of money, suggesting that robbery was not the primary motive behind the slayings. John Wayne Gacy, the Killer Clown John Wayne Gacy, born in Chicago, Illinois in 1942, remains one of the most horrifying serial slayers in American criminal history. His early life was marred by an abusive relationship with his alcoholic father, leading to a troubled childhood filled with instances of physical and emotional abuse. Despite these challenges, Gacy tried to establish a semblance of normalcy, getting involved in politics in the community, and marrying twice. However, his dark side was evident from an early age, including a conviction for a criminal act of an unnatural nature against a teenage boy in 1968. Unfortunately, he only served 18 months of a 10-year sentence for this act. John Wayne Gacy led a seemingly respectable life in his community outside of his criminal activities. Known for his sociability, Gacy was a prominent figure in his suburban Chicago neighborhood. He was not just a local businessman, but also involved in community activities that positioned him as a trustworthy and benevolent figure. Gacy founded a successful construction business, PDM Contractors, which not only bolstered his standing in the community, but also facilitated his sinister activities under the guise of offering employment. Beyond his business endeavors, Gacy was known for his active participation in local politics, where he volunteered as the Democratic Precinct Captain. His political involvement granted him access to influential circles, further enhancing his reputation as a community leader. This status was complemented by his engagement in charitable events, notably his performances as Pogo the Clown at children's parties. His clown persona endeared him to many, but also became one of his defining characteristics when the true nature of his crimes were revealed. Moreover, Gacy was adept at building personal relationships within his neighborhood. He was known to host elaborate block parties, fostering a sense of community and camaraderie among his neighbors. These events, coupled with his seemingly generous and gregarious nature, built him a solid reputation, which would later be seen as cover for his immoral and evil acts. Gacy's criminal activities escalated in the 1970s, culminating in the horrific acts that led to his arrest and eventual ending by the judicial system. The turning point in the Gacy saga came with the disappearance of teenager Robert Peast in 1978, which led to Gacy's arrest. On December 11, 1978, Gacy visited a pharmacy in Des Plaines, Illinois, to discuss a remodeling project with the owner. Robert Peast was a teenage boy employed by the pharmacy as a part-time worker. During this visit, Gacy was aware that 15-year-old Robert Peast was listening, and Gacy mentioned that his firm often employed teenage boys at a high hourly rate. This statement was designed to attract the attention of Peast and highlights how Gacy manipulated his victims from the very beginning. Shortly afterward, when Peast's mother arrived to pick him up, he told her about the potential job opportunity with the contractor and asked her to wait. Peast left the pharmacy at 9 p.m., going to meet with Gacy and promising to return soon. However, this meeting was a ploy by Gacy to lure Peast to his home. Once there, 
the situation turned sinister. Gacy offered Peace a soft drink and began probing him with questions about his willingness to work for money. Gacy managed to trick Peace into putting on handcuffs under the guise of showing him a magic trick. This was a common method Gacy used to subdue his victims. Gacy slew Peace that same evening, and in an act of extreme detachment from reality, or perhaps just pure psychopathy, took a business call during the process of the slaying. When Peast failed to return as promised, his mother reported it to the police immediately, with the pharmacy owner advising the police Peast left with Gacy. Gacy gave a statement to the police in the early hours of December 12, 1978, which led to a search warrant being issued. Police obtained and conducted a search warrant on December 13, 1978 and recovered evidence that made them believe Gacy may be keeping Peast alive at a secondary location. Rather than immediately arrest him, Gacy was put on surveillance in hopes of being able to save Peast, whom they believed could still be alive. While under surveillance, Gacy, displaying his sociopathic tendencies fully, invited two police detectives out for dinner. At this dinner, he famously remarked, quote, clowns can get away with non-consensual ending. Except he didn't say non-consensual ending because he wasn't trying to make YouTube content circa 2024. On December 19, 1978, out of pure delusion, or out of a pure sociopathic desire for absolute control, Gacy sued the Des Plaines Police Department for damages related to their investigation. Eventually, the police conducted a full search of the crawl space beneath Gacy's house, and what they discovered shocked everyone. His house contained the remains of 33 young men, making him one of the most prolific serial slayers in American history. Despite being caught dead to rights, a trial ensued regardless, with Gacy's defense claiming insanity. Gacy's trial was a media spectacle, filled with harrowing testimonies from the families of the victims and evidence of his brutal acts. Witnesses recounted their last interactions with their loved ones, while others provided first-hand accounts of narrow escapes from Gacy's clutches. The prosecution successfully argued that Gacy's outward normalcy and ability to conceal his true nature pointed to his full awareness and responsibility for his actions. Despite attempts by the defense to claim mental illness, Gacy was deemed legally sane and accountable for his actions. I feel that it's important to clarify here that being found sane in this context is not the same as being viewed as sane in general. Clearly no sane person ever does even a fraction of the acts which Gacy committed. Legal sanity simply means that he was able to distinguish right from wrong at the time of the slayings. He was sentenced to the ultimate punishment on March 13, 1980, and in a remarkably quick turnaround time, Gacy met his end via injection on May 10, 1994, the slaying of Faith Hedgepeth. In the early hours of September 7, 2012, Faith Hedgepeth's life came to a tragic end in her Chapel Hill apartment, igniting a complex investigation that spanned nearly a decade. Faith, a 19-year-old student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, was found by friends in a disturbing scene that prompted an immediate law enforcement response. Her involvement in Native American cultural events and aspirations for the future highlighted the profound loss felt by the community and her tribe. Notably, her tribe would play a significant role in ensuring Faith's case did not go cold. The evening preceding the discovery Faith and her roommate visited a local nightclub, returning home in the early hours. Notably, disturbances were reported by a neighbor shortly after their return. Communications from Faith's phone to acquaintances in the early morning hours and details from her roommate were key in reconstructing the timeline of that night. Despite a swift law enforcement response, the case was marred by challenges. Initial efforts to gather and analyze evidence, including DNA collected at the scene, did not immediately lead to a suspect. 
The investigation faced scrutiny for the decision to seal case records, which some speculated could be concealing investigative missteps. This sealing was contested by media outlets, arguing for public access to the investigation's progress. The community, along with the Haliwasaponi tribe, rallied for justice, contributing to a reward fund in hopes of encouraging leads. Breakthroughs in the case came from advances in forensic analysis and the persistent efforts of detectives. These efforts culminated in the arrest of Miguel Salguero Olivares in September 2021 on a first-degree ending charge. Notably, none of the allegations against the accused have been proven in a court of law, and he remains innocent until proven guilty. I note that despite the arrest of Salguero, as well as the charges brought against him, the details on what led to this charge are extremely scant. I note that as of March 2024, there have been no further updates in this case. Given where the case stands right now, I hope to have an update on this case in a future entry to this series. The Slaying of John Allen Chow In November 2018, the world learned about John Allen Chow, a 26-year-old American with a long-standing commitment to evangelism. His dedication to missionary work was part of a larger life theme evident from his educational background and previous missionary trips. Chow, an Oral Roberts University graduate, was deeply involved in student missionary groups. He participated in missions across various regions, including South Africa and Iraqi Kurdistan, showcasing his commitment to spreading the faith. He had a particularly keen interest in bringing Christianity to people who had never heard of Jesus Christ before. With this in mind, he embarked on a mission to introduce Christianity to the North Sentinelese people, a secluded tribe residing on North Sentinel Island in the Indian Ocean. The North Sentinelese are known for their extreme resistance to any external contact. John Allen Chow prepared meticulously for his mission, influenced by figures like Jim Elliott, a missionary who was killed while attempting to evangelize the Huarani tribe in Ecuador. He participated in a boot camp type activity where other members of his congregation pretended to be hostile tribespeople. I question whether Bob the life insurance salesman was quite as ferocious in his opposition to being contacted and converted as an actual Sentinelese Islander, but hey, I wasn't there. Chow's final efforts, as detailed in his diaries, demonstrate his clear understanding of the dangers involved and his profound commitment to his cause. Chow was, to put it simply, very much ready to give his life to this cause. However, his writings indicated that he was perhaps not of sound mind, calling North Sentinel Island, quote, Satan's last stronghold on earth in 2018. Personally, if I was going to focus on quote-unquote evil islands, circa 2018, I may have chosen to focus on Little St. James, rather than North Sentinel Island. At any rate, despite his awareness of these risks, he believed his mission to share his faith justified almost certain doom. Chow's approach to North Sentinel Island was fraught with challenges. Despite warnings from the fishermen who transported him close to the island, he proceeded towards the shore in a kayak. He was carrying a waterproof Bible as a symbolic and practical gesture of his mission. Upon his approach, Chow tried to communicate with the Sentinelese by offering gifts and attempting to convey messages of goodwill. However, his efforts were met with suspicion and hostility, typical reactions from a tribe that has consistently resisted external contacts for centuries. The Sentinelese's response varied from amusement and bewilderment to outright aggression, indicating their confusion and rejection of his presence and offerings. In an attempt to bridge the communication gap, Chow even sang worship songs and spoke in Kosa, a South African language completely foreign to the islanders. This unsurprisingly led to moments of silence or laughter from the tribe who were presumably extremely confused by Chow's attempt. The situation escalated when a young islander shot an arrow that pierced Chow's Bible, a symbolic act of rejection 
and a clear sign of the Sentinelese's desire to remain undisturbed. Undeterred, Chow made a final attempt to reach out to the tribe on November 17th, asking the fishermen to leave him on the island. Tragically, this last visit resulted in his death, as indicated by the fishermen's reports of seeing his body being dragged and buried by the islanders. In response to his demise, Chow's family expressed forgiveness towards those involved and requested leniency for the local contacts who aided his journey. At any rate, given the nature of the slaying, none of the North Sentinelese have ever been brought to justice for the slaying. The only individuals charged in relation to this case have been the fishermen who aided Chow. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind this channel. If you're enjoying my content, please do me a favor and hit the like and subscribe buttons and tap that notification bell. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership or the Patreon and joining the Discord community. The YouTube and Patreon memberships allow me to engage in less self-censorship. After all, your support can free me from concerns about demonetization. And trust me, when I'm hitting on the sort of topics I'm hitting in this video, demonetization is always a very real concern. The Mr. Cruel case is one of Australia's most notorious unsolved criminal cases, spanning from the late 1980s to the early 1990s in Melbourne. The first known attack attributed to Mr. Cruel occurred in August 1987, when he broke into a home in Lower Plenty, attacking two children while their parents were bound and gagged. This pattern of behavior, breaking into homes at night, binding the victims, and meticulously avoiding leaving physical evidence, became his modus operandi. His most infamous crimes involved the abduction and subsequent release of three girls from their homes between 1988 and 1990. Unfortunately, unspeakable acts were committed in the process. He is also suspected to have abducted and slain a child in 1991. Sadly, this case remains unsolved over 30 years later. Given his ability to avoid leaving behind any meaningful evidence, I have to question if he is someone involved in forensic investigations in some capacity. The slaying of Layla Fowler. This case was recommended by Discord community member Carbrov 2049. Remember to leave a comment below or to join the Discord if you want to leave a recommendation for a case I should cover in this series. In April 2013, the small community of Valley Springs, California was shaken by the tragic loss of eight-year-old Layla Fowler. The events began to unfold when Layla's older brother, Isaiah Fowler, reported that he had found his sister slain in their home while their parents were out. Initially, the community rallied around the grieving family, with hundreds attending a vigil in Layla's honor. However, as the investigation proceeded, discrepancies emerged between Isaiah's account and the forensic evidence. Notably, there was a lack of bloody footprints, which contradicted Isaiah's story of an intruder. Moreover, the position of Layla's body and the timing of the 911 call raised further questions. A steak knife from the kitchen, which matched the injuries, was found placed back in a drawer, hinting at a domestic source of the conflict rather than an external intruder. Further, there was no sign of forced entry, and forensic examination of the Fowler home didn't indicate any findings which suggested an intruder. Isaiah was arrested and charged with second-degree slaying, a decision that divided the community and surprised many who knew him as a normal, caring brother. During the trial, the prosecution pointed out inconsistencies in Isaiah's story and questioned the absence of an intruder based on the lack of DNA evidence at the scene. Despite the family's defense claiming mishandling of evidence and questioning the autopsy's thoroughness, Isaiah was found guilty and sentenced to remain in custody until the age of 23. In a surprise twist, in February 2018, a retrial was ordered, a move which the defense claimed would vindicate Isaiah. 
Later that same year, Isaiah was convicted again, and he presently remains incarcerated in relation to this horrific crime. Despite the conviction, the case has left unresolved questions, especially since no clear motive was ever established for the tragic event. Jody Hoosentrout. Jody Hoosentrout was a 27-year-old news anchor for KIMT, a CBS affiliate in Mason City, Iowa, who disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Hoosentrout was born on June 5, 1968 in Long Prairie, Minnesota. She developed an early interest in broadcasting, leading her to pursue a degree in mass communications from St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. After graduation, Hoosentrude embarked on her journalism career, working in various small markets, including Cedar Rapids, Iowa, before settling in Mason City, Iowa. Known for her dedication and vibrant personality, Hoosentrude quickly became a familiar face in the community, engaging viewers with her warmth and enthusiasm for storytelling. Her disappearance on June 27, 1995 remains unsolved and has gone on to become one of the most significant cold cases in Minnesota history. Hoosentrout was reported missing after failing to show up for her morning news segment. The previous evening, she had played golf with friends and was reportedly in good spirits. Concerns were raised when Hoosentrout didn't arrive at work by 4 a.m. for her shift, prompting a colleague to call her. Hoosentrout answered, mentioning she was on her way, but she never arrived. Evidence at her apartment complex was highly suggestive of a struggle. Hoosentrout's red Mazda Miata was found in the parking lot, along with her personal items scattered around, including her shoes, hairspray, blow dryer, and earrings. The key to her car was bent, found in the lock of the trunk, indicating a possible abduction scenario. There were also signs of a struggle, including a palm print on her vehicle. This palm print has never been matched to a suspect. Despite extensive searches, no further evidence was found in the vicinity. Investigations into Hoosentrout's disappearance initially focused on her personal and professional life. Authorities interviewed friends, family, and co-workers, but no substantial leads were developed. Over the years, various theories have been proposed, including potential stalking, as Hoosentrout had expressed concerns about unfamiliar individuals around her home before her disappearance. Another theory considered was her investigation into drug activity in the area, which might have put her in danger, though evidence supporting this is limited. The case received national attention, with coverage on television programs such as America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries, generating tips but no breakthroughs. She was ultimately declared legally dead in May 2001, and though her case is cold, it's still being actively investigated by the authorities. The I-70 Killer. The I-70 Killer is a term used to describe an unidentified individual responsible for a series of slayings that occurred in 1992. These acts took place along the Interstate 70 corridor, spanning across several states including Indiana, Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. This case has haunted investigators and the public for decades due to its seemingly random nature and the killer's ability to evade capture. The series of slayings began on April 8, 1992, with Robin Fuldauer in Indianapolis, Indiana. Fuldauer was a manager of a shoe store and was last spotted alive at 1.30 on that day. Her body was subsequently discovered in the back of the store. Despite the nature of the act, virtually nothing was taken from the store, suggesting robbery was not a primary motivation. Over the next three months, six more victims were slain, with the last known ending occurring on May 7, 1992. The victims were predominantly young women working alone in small retail stores or shops. There is no known motivation for the slayings. The killer only ever took nominal sums of money, and despite women being the primary target, they were thankfully not subject to indecent acts. The investigation into the I-70 murders was extensive, 
involving multiple law enforcement agencies across the states where the slayings occurred. Despite the efforts to find connections between the victims, no personal link was established, leading investigators to theorize that the selection of victims was opportunistic. The proximity of the crime scenes to I-70 suggested a perpetrator who was familiar with the area and possibly used the interstate for quick escapes. A significant breakthrough in the case was the discovery of ballistic evidence linking the murders together, confirming the same weapon was used in each instance. Witnesses provided descriptions of a suspect, a white male of average height with a slender build and in some cases, noted to have sandy blonde or reddish hair. Estimates of his age vary widely, with estimates ranging from him being in his early 20s to his late 30s. Composite sketches were circulated, but no definitive suspect was identified. The investigation also explored the possibility of the killer changing his appearance or using disguises to avoid detection, though again, nothing was confirmed. The case presented a number of challenges for law enforcement, primarily the geographic spread of the slayings across multiple jurisdictions, complicated coordination and information sharing among agencies. No suspects have ever been publicly identified in relation to this case. And at this point, it's unclear to what extent the case is still being investigated. The disappearance of Amy Lynn Bradley Amy Lynn Bradley, a 23-year-old from Chesterfield County, Virginia, vanished while on a Caribbean cruise aboard the Rhapsody of the Seas, a ship operated by Royal Caribbean Cruises in March 1998. Amy Bradley's family, consisting of her parents Ron and Iva Bradley, and her brother Brad, embarked on a week-long cruise on March 21, 1998. The cruise was intended as a family trip combining relaxation with the joy of exploration. Amy was seen for the last time in the early hours of March 24, 1998. She was witnessed by her family on their cabin's balcony in the wee hours around 5.30 a.m. after attending a party on the ship. Her disappearance was noted later that morning when her family found she was not in her cabin or anywhere else on the ship. Upon realizing Amy was missing, her family immediately alerted the ship's crew, prompting a search on the vessel. They pleaded with the crew to keep all the passengers on board the ship. However, sadly, this was not done. The ship was en route to Curaçao, in the Antilles, at the time of her disappearance. Despite thorough searches of the ship and inquiries among passengers and crew, no sign of Amy was found on board. The FBI got involved, as did various other agencies, given the international waters where the disappearance occurred. However, these efforts yielded no concrete evidence or leads as to Amy's whereabouts. Investigations into Amy Bradley's disappearance faced significant challenges. The lack of security footage capturing her movements on the ship in her final hours compounded the mystery. Several passengers reported seeing Amy in the early hours of March 24th, adding credibility to the timeline established by her family. Theories about what happened ranged from accidental overboard falling to abduction. Another theory involves a potential conflict with a member of the ship's band. However, Amy is confirmed to have returned to her room on the night in question, and as discussed, she was seen by her family in the morning. Over the years, there have been reported sightings of Amy in various Caribbean islands. One notable claim came from a sailor who reported seeing her in a house of ill repute in 1998, suggesting she might have been kidnapped and been a victim of human trafficking. Other sightings were reported in the years following her disappearance, but none led to a definitive conclusion on her fate. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also, once again, if you enjoy my content, please consider donating via Patreon or signing up for a YouTube membership. The topics I cover can lead to demonetization of my videos, 
and with your support, I can be less bound by self-censorship. Shout out to my patrons, Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, and z -Volts. Also, big shout out to YouTube members Jordan All and Syntax Nexus. Until next time, stay safe and healthy, and peace out. Welcome to part three of the Ultimate True Crime Iceberg series. In this series, we deep dive into true crime cases, in particular, those in which the victims paid the ultimate price, the slaying of Rinaldo John Rivera. In the early 1980s, the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico was shaken by the tragic end of Father Rinaldo John Rivera. Born in Santa Fe in 1924, Father Rinaldo was a devoted priest, deeply embedded in his community. Ordained in 1953, he was later appointed rector of St. Francis Cathedral in 1975, where he remained until his untimely demise in 1982. The events leading to Father Ronaldo's demise began on the evening of August 5, 1982, when he received a call at his rectory from a man claiming that his grandfather needed last rites near a rest stop in Waldo. Father Ronaldo drove to the location, but never returned. Two days later, his body was discovered in a field near the La Bajada rest stop, marked by a gunshot wound and evidence of strangulation. Despite a thorough investigation, including examining fingerprints found in his abandoned car and a psychological profile developed by the FBI, the identity of his assailants remained a mystery. George Semkis, a suspect linked to the case, was arrested but never charged with the crime due to insufficient evidence, leaving questions around Father Ronaldo's demise unanswered. Semkis was previously accused of having stolen from Rivera's cathedral, and some theorize that this led to Semkis coming for Rivera. Complicating matters further, the slaying and disappearance of other priests during the same period added layers of mystery to an already perplexing situation. Most famously, there was the disappearance and presumed death of Reverend John Patrick Kerrigan in Montana two years later, under eerily similar circumstances. The similarities between the two cases fueled theories of a possible connection. Kerrigan's past, which included time spent in New Mexico, raised questions about a potential link between the two men. However, law enforcement has remained divided on whether the two incidents were connected and no conclusive evidence has been presented to link the cases definitively. Further, there's the theory that Kerrigan, unlike Rivera, was not actually ended, but rather that Kerrigan left of his own accord to dodge accusations of unnatural activities with minors. The Cape Town Paid Companionship Worker Killer. This is a suggestion from community member Anna Mart Rowland. Thanks so much for this suggestion. The Cape Town Paid Companionship Worker Killer, also known as the Cape Town Strangler, was an unidentified individual responsible for the tragic end of 16 women in Cape Town. This serial slayer was active from at least 1992 to 1996, though of course he may have plied his cruel trade elsewhere as well. The criminal's method involved picking up victims on rainy nights ending their lives via strangulation within his vehicle and disposing of their bodies in pre-selected locations. This pattern was consistent across all cases, with the attacker ensuring the victims were left in varying locations to avoid detection. One unique aspect of these cases was that the criminal attempted to stage the crime scenes, posing victims to mislead investigations. Notably, None of the women were subject to indecent assaults prior to their slayings. This detail, among others, led to difficulties in linking the crimes directly to one individual. The case remains unsolved at present. The police did make an arrest and charge in relation to one of the slayings. However, for reasons that are about to be abundantly clear, I'm not going to repeat this man's name here. The police released this man due to lack of evidence and it was later found that the authorities falsified the evidence against him in an attempt to tie him to the crime. 
In my view, this attempt to frame an innocent man for the slayings has likely completely botched any chance of a conviction of the actual killer, given that the actual killer left no DNA. However, that said, there is a description of the perpetrator, though admittedly the description is very vague. According to an interview with a survivor, the individual was a well put together white male in his 20s or 30s and appeared to be a professional of some sort. The Nagarkot Massacre. The Nagarkot incident occurred on December 14, 2005, at the Kali Devi Temple near Nagarkot in Nepal. It resulted in significant loss and injury. 11 individuals lost their lives and 19 others were injured. The incident unfolded around 11.30 p.m. when Basudev Thapa, a 26-year-old off-duty Royal Nepalese Army Sergeant, initiated the tragic events. Thapa had a confrontation with youths from the nearby Pipalbot village with whom he had long-standing issues. After an altercation where he was reportedly assaulted, Thapa left the scene only to return armed with a semi-automatic rifle. Despite being off duty, he managed to leave his barracks with the weapon without being stopped, which was against protocol. Importantly, he also got reinforcements, three fellow soldiers, to come along with him. Once they arrived back, Thapa then fired shots indiscriminately at villagers who were attending a celebration at the temple. The initial report stated that Thapa ended his own life following the spree. However, there were discrepancies regarding his death. Witnesses claimed that he was shot by one of his colleagues while he was still firing at the civilians. Also, witnesses claimed that they had seen the other soldiers fire at civilians as well. An examination of Thapa's body later suggested that he could not have self-inflicted the fatal chest wound contradicting the official narrative that he had acted alone and ended himself. In the aftermath, there was significant outcry and demands for a thorough investigation, compounded by actions from the army that appeared to involve cleaning the crime scene. The families of the victims protested and an official inquiry was set up. However, the results were questionable. The official report concluded that Thapa had acted alone and labeled his death as self-inflicted, despite conflicting witness statements and evidence suggesting otherwise. A popular quote-unquote conspiracy theory is that all four of the soldiers were shooting, with Thapa being executed and used as a scapegoat by the others and the Nepalese military. The disappearance of Lisa Lynn Bishop. Lisa Lynn Bishop, a young woman from Atlanta, Georgia, vanished without a trace in 1988. She had plans to travel to Haiti aboard a freighter named the Free Dawn under the command of a mysterious German man known as Florian Meyer Borch. Lisa was an aspiring journalist and reportedly took this trip to gather material for a story. However, she never returned and no one has heard from her since. The Free Dawn, the vessel Lisa was supposed to travel on, adds a layer of mystery to her disappearance. There are conflicting reports about the ship's journey, its condition, and even whether that is the correct name of the ship. The Free Dawn departed from Miami on December 17, 1988, with a crew consisting of Florian, Lisa, and seven Haitians, of whom nothing has been reported on. This would be the last time Lisa, the ship, the captain or the crew were seen. Some sources claim that the Freedon was seen in Miami or around the Caribbean after Lisa's disappearance, but these sightings have not been conclusively verified. Florian Meyer Borch, the captain with whom Lisa was last known to be, is another figure shrouded in ambiguity. Efforts to locate and question him following Lisa's disappearance yielded little information. His connection to the case is a critical element. However, his whereabouts and potential involvement remains largely unexplained. The last confirmed sighting of Florian was on Grand Cayman, circa early 1989. However, Lisa was not spotted with him, heightening concerns. 
The investigation into Lisa's disappearance faced numerous challenges. The international nature of her travel plan, involving a trip to Haiti, complicated jurisdictional and investigative efforts. Several theories have been proposed regarding Lisa's fate. Some speculate that she may have fallen victim to foul play, possibly related to the individuals she was with or the places she intended to visit. Others suggest the possibility of an accident, a deliberate disappearance, or even sinister allegations of human trafficking. However, without concrete evidence, these theories remain speculative. While researching this case, one thing struck me. Everyone simply accepts that Lisa got on a boat in Miami. However, as far as I can tell, there are no witnesses who actually saw her get on the boat. My own hypothesis is that she may never have even made it to the boat and that she may have been slain on the trip to the supposed boat. The Danny Casolaro Mystery Danny Casolaro, an investigative journalist, was found dead in a hotel bathtub in 1991 under circumstances that sparked widespread suspicion and controversy. His death occurred amidst his investigation into a network he called the Octopus, deepening the mystery. Casolaro was investigating a complex web of alleged criminal activities involving high-level government officials, intelligence agencies, and private corporations. His focus was on the INS law affair, involving the potentially illegal redistribution of software called Promise. INS Law and Casolaro alleged that the Department of Justice stole Promise from INS Law, installed a backdoor in the software, and distributed it to foreign nations. According to the allegations, this allowed the American government to spy on these nations in various capacities through the backdoor function. Casolaro believed that the Inslaw case was a part of a larger conspiracy, which he termed the Octopus. This investigation led him across various facets of corruption, including arms dealing and espionage. In early August 1991, Casolaro told his family he was close to concluding his investigation and would be traveling to Martinsburg, West Virginia, to meet a key source. His optimism and determination seemed undiminished. According to reports, he met several individuals in Martinsburg, though their identities remain largely unconfirmed. However, at least one of these people is thought to have been an intelligence operative. Casolaro's family and friends reported he had received threatening messages and warned them that if something happened to him, it would not be an accident. On August 10, 1991, Casolaro was found dead in his hotel room's bathtub with his wrists slashed multiple times. The scene was quickly ruled a self-ending by local authorities, but several unusual factors cast doubt on this conclusion. His research papers and notes were missing from the hotel room, the room's carpet was wet, and there were no fingerprints, not even his own. The missing documents, which he claimed would expose the alleged conspiracy, were never recovered. The absence of fingerprints and the presence of an unidentified hair and blood stain in the bathtub added to the ambiguity. Furthermore, his family stated that Casolaro was not known to have any such mental health struggles. The investigation into Casolaro's death faced several challenges, including alleged mishandling by local police and the FBI's initial reluctance to get involved. Theories about his death range from him being silenced to prevent exposure of the octopus to being a victim of his own web of conspiracy theories. Some speculate that he may have been misled or manipulated by sources with their own agendas. And if all that wasn't enough to convince you that he may have been onto something, at his funeral, a limousine pulled up. A military officer exited, approached Danny's coffin, and put a medal on the coffin, saluted, and left the scene. The slaying of Charles Morgan. The death of Charles Morgan, a Tucson-based escrow agent, involves highly suspect circumstances. 
Morgan's story begins on March 22, 1977, when he disappeared from his home in Tucson, Arizona, only to reappear three days later in a state that sparked widespread speculation and concern. Upon his return, Morgan was in a distressed condition, unable to speak and wearing handcuffs. He communicated to his wife, Ruth, through written notes, explaining that he had been kidnapped and subjected to a traumatic ordeal that involved being physically harmed to prevent him from speaking. He indicated that his vocal cords had been temporarily damaged by a drug that was administered to him during his captivity. Morgan also insisted that his family was in danger and that they shouldn't contact the police under any circumstances, suggesting the involvement of a powerful criminal organization. For the next two months, Morgan lived under a self-imposed state of high alert. He took to wearing a bulletproof vest, carried a weapon for self-defense, and drove his daughters to and from school. Despite these precautions, Morgan vanished again on June 7, 1977. This time, he would not return home alive. His body was discovered on June 18th in the desert near Tucson. The circumstances of his death were peculiar and troubling. He had been shot once in the back of the head with his own 357 Magnum, which was found near his body. Despite the scene initially suggesting a case of ending by his own hand, several aspects of the case suggested foul play. Morgan was wearing his bulletproof vest at the time of his death, an unusual choice if he had planned to end himself. Also, and I can't get into too much detail on YouTube, but the location of the gunshot wound and the positioning of the body raised doubts about the possibility of a consensual shot. Additionally, a pair of sunglasses not belonging to Morgan was found at the scene, and a $2 bill was discovered inside his underwear. This bill was marked with seven Spanish names and a Bible verse. The meaning of this, if any, was never decoded. In the days following the discovery of his body, further revelations added layers of complexity to the case. Ruth Morgan, his widow, received a phone call from an anonymous woman claiming that Charles was alive and in hiding, but this claim never materialized into any concrete evidence of his survival. The investigation into Morgan's death uncovered his secret life. This secret life included allegations of money laundering, connections with organized crime, and covert work for the federal government. Morgan had allegedly confided in his attorney about receiving death threats related to his work, which involved large-scale financial transactions for unknown clients, possibly as part of a money laundering operation for the mob. The official investigation concluded with the ruling of Morgan's death was by his own hand. Many, including his family and private investigators, have found this hard to accept given the odd circumstances surrounding his slaying. The cryptic clues he left behind, his apparent fear for his life, and his secretive activities suggested a more sinister explanation. However, this case doesn't end here. It's about to get a lot more unusual. A journalist was investigating the case and uncovered evidence on illicit gold and platinum transactions. After Devereaux appeared on Unsolved Mysteries to discuss this case, Doug Johnston, an individual who drove a near-identical car and bore a strong resemblance to Devereaux and worked across the street from Devereaux, was slain. And to tie it back to Danny Casolaro, Casolaro had reached out to Devereaux with information regarding this case prior to Casolaro's own untimely demise. Also, stay tuned because later in this episode, we'll be discussing the Doug Johnson slaying. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please do me a favor and hit the like and subscribe buttons and that notification bell. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership or the Patreon and joining the Discord community. The YouTube and Patreon memberships allow me to engage in less self-censorship. After all, 
your support can free me from concerns about demonetization. And trust me, when you hit on the sort of topics I hit on demonetization is always a very real concern. The Slaying of Anna Anton In the quiet farming town of Lyons, Nebraska, the case of Anna Anton, a disabled woman, gained notoriety primarily due to the involvement of Gregory J. Webb, the town's police chief. Webb was convicted of causing Anton's demise and tampering with evidence. The story unfolded when Anton disappeared on December 15, 1986, and her body was discovered 12 days later, showing signs of severe harm. She was found 20 miles north of Lyons, having been shot three times and bearing additional injuries, which was particularly shocking given her vulnerability. Webb, who fled following the incident, had various interactions and sightings that eventually led to his capture. Before fleeing, he withdrew all the money from his savings account and exchanged his personal vehicle for another at a dealership. His eventual escape route took him through Central and South America before settling in Daytona Beach, Florida under a new identity. His new life included altered documents and evasive measures whenever his identity came under scrutiny. His past finally caught up with him when an episode of Unsolved Mysteries featuring his case aired, leading to his identification and arrest by authorities in 1993, initiated by a former colleague's tip. After his arrest, Webb was returned to Nebraska, where he faced charges related to Anton's death. The complexities of the case and the evidence involved led to Webb accepting a plea of no contest to manslaughter, ultimately resulting in his release from prison in August 2002. While this case was solved, something about the resolution seems so inherently unsatisfactory for the taking of Anna's life. The Castration Serial Slayer. Between 1980 and 1986, a series of tragic events unfolded across at least five U.S. states, including Wyoming, Pennsylvania, Utah, Georgia, and Connecticut. Young men were kidnapped, shot in the back of the head, and then castrated post-mortem. This string of incidents, known as the castration serial slayings, initially appeared to be unrelated due to the vast geographic spread of the crime scenes. By 1989, forensic evidence linked two of the victims through the use of the same revolver, suggesting a single individual's involvement in at least these cases, with the others likely related. The first suspected victim, 27-year-old Willard Edward Judd, was discovered in 1980 near Casper, Wyoming. Following him, Wayne Lee Rifendifer, Marty James Shook, an unidentified individual in Georgia, and Jack Franklin Andrews were found under similarly gruesome circumstances. Despite the brutality of these acts and some investigative leads, including a suspect in San Francisco found with preserved male parts, the case remains cold. The case of the castration serial slayings is particularly challenging due to the lack of conclusive evidence linking all the crimes conclusively to one perpetrator. Also, the passage of time creates extreme difficulties moving forward. Further, aside from the two cases mentioned, there is nothing to definitively tie these slayings together, aside from the removal of male parts. The Death of Bruiser Brody The tragic event that led to the demise of Frank Donald Goodish, famously known as Bruiser Brody, remains one of professional wrestling's darkest moments. On July 17, 1988, in Bayamon, Puerto Rico, Brody's life came to an untimely end under circumstances that would stir controversy and unanswered questions for decades to come. The conflict that led to Brody's demise began in the locker room of a wrestling event. Brody was asked by fellow wrestler Jose Gonzalez, known in the ring as Invader One, to discuss business in the shower area away from the rest of the locker room. This meeting turned fatal when Gonzalez inflicted severe injuries on Brody. Despite the immediate chaos and the efforts of fellow wrestlers to get medical help, Brody succumbed to his injuries. 
the police investigation and subsequent trial of Jose Gonzalez were marred by a lack of cooperation from witnesses and logistical mishaps. One of the biggest quote-unquote logistical mishaps was the fact that the killing blade was never recovered. Key witnesses, including wrestlers who were present at the scene, received subpoenas too late, rendering their evidence moot as the jury had already reached a verdict. Gonzalez was acquitted of all charges, with the defense claiming he acted in self-defense. This outcome left many within the wrestling community and Brody's family seeking justice that seemed forever out of reach. The story of Bruiser Brody's life and the circumstances of his death have been recounted in various wrestling documentaries and articles. Yet, despite the passage of time, the complete truth of what happened in the locker room remains elusive. I anticipate that we will never have the truth of what happened in the locker room that fateful day. Jose Gonzalez was acquitted of the slaying and found to have acted in self-defense by a jury. Gonzalez has no incentive to ever say anything further as whatever he says could be of no benefit to him and could only work against him. Further, Gonzalez continued to wrestle and enjoy a successful career in the Puerto Rican wrestling scene. Astonishingly, Jose Gonzalez only retired from wrestling in 2022 at the age of 74. The Kurt Sova Case Kurt Sova, a 17-year-old from Newburgh Heights, Ohio, vanished under mysterious circumstances in October 1981 before the discovery of his body days later. Known for his easygoing nature, Kurt's disappearance was out of character, sparking immediate concern. He was last seen alive attending a Halloween house party. According to his friend who he attended with, Kurt was drinking Everclear while he was there. When he didn't return home, his family launched a frantic search. The search for Kurt involved local authorities, friends, family, and community members. Despite extensive efforts, including scouring the neighborhood and nearby areas. No trace of him was found initially. The police investigation uncovered few leads, with party attendees providing limited and sometimes conflicting information. The lack of evidence and clues added a layer of frustration and mystery to the case. Five days after his disappearance, Kurt's body was discovered in a ravine, a location previously searched raising questions about the body's placement after the initial search. The autopsy revealed no clear cause of death, no signs of struggle, and minimal alcohol content in his system. This discovery only deepened the mystery, as the circumstances of his death seemed inexplicable, with medical examiners unable to determine how or why he died. Law enforcement faced criticism for their handling of the Kurt Sova case. The initial delay in treating his disappearance as serious and the subsequent inability to provide answers or a clear direction in the investigation led to public frustration. Over the years, the case remained open but inactive, with occasional reviews yielding no new clues. The slaying of Doug Johnston. The 1990 slaying of Doug Johnston in Phoenix, Arizona is speculated to be related to the Charles Morgan case discussed previously in this video. Doug Johnston, a 27-year-old computer draftsman, was found dead in his car outside the electronics firm where he worked. The incident occurred on the night of May 14, 1990, leaving more questions than answers. Johnston was shot in the head, execution style, a brutal and sudden act that seemed to come out of nowhere. He was discovered in the early hours of May 15th in the driver's seat of his vehicle with the single gunshot wound. There were no witnesses to the crime and the murder weapon was never found. The lack of evidence, motive, and suspects made this case particularly challenging for investigators. Initially, the police explored the possibility of a personal motive examining Johnston's background, relationships, and interactions. However, they found no evidence of conflicts, threats, or reasons why anyone would target him.
Johnston was described by friends and family as a quiet, hardworking individual with no known enemies, making the motive for his murder even more perplexing. As discussed in the earlier entry, there's significant speculation that Don Devereaux was the intended target of this hit. Devereaux advised that his sources, including American and Israeli intelligence operatives, confirmed that the hit was meant for him. I'm going to say that this one will never be solved. This appears to be a very sad case of mistaken identity. The slaying of Jill Lynn Udo. In January 2001, the community of Syracuse, New York was shaken by the tragic loss of 18-year-old Jill Lynn Uto. Born on March 20, 1982, Uto was an ambitious young woman, studying to become a paramedic while working at a local clothing store. Her life was cut short when she was found deceased in her apartment by her mother, Joanne Browning, a day after she failed to show up for a planned Super Bowl viewing with her family. This day marked the beginning of a long, unresolved investigation into her demise. Jill Lynn's apartment, located at 600 James Street, showed no signs of forced entry, and it appeared that nothing was stolen. The details surrounding the case suggest that the incident occurred in the early afternoon, with the assailant using one of Jill Lynn's own kitchen knives. Despite extensive investigations, interviews, and public appeals on national television shows, no suspects have been publicly identified, leaving the case unsolved to this day. The lack of closure has had a profound impact on Yuto's family and the community. Joanne Browning, who passed away in 2007, dedicated her years following the incident to raising awareness and seeking justice for her daughter. The Syracuse Police Department continues to investigate the case, aided by advances in forensic technology and the dedication of cold case units. If you have any information pertaining to this case, please reach out to the Syracuse Police Department. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also, once again, if you enjoy my content, please consider donating via Patreon or signing up for a YouTube membership. The topics I cover can lead to demonetization of my videos, and with your support, I can be less bound by self-censorship. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts and director Delta. Also, big shout out to YouTube members Jordan All and Syntax Nexus. And also a huge shout out to every individual watcher and listener. I love you all so much and you all make this possible. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out everyone. Welcome to part four of the Ultimate True Crime Iceberg series. In this series, we profile a wide range of true crime cases, though most cases focus on situations where the victims paid the ultimate price. The Dnepropetrovsk Maniacs. In the summer of 2007, the city of Dnepropetrovsk, Ukraine, experienced a string of brutal incidents that shocked the local community and the world at large. Over the span of several weeks, 21 residents of the city fell victim to violent acts committed by a group of individuals who would later be known as the Maniacs. This group comprised three young men, Viktor Sayenko, Igor Saprunuk, and Alexander Hanza. Their crimes seemed to lack any clear motive and targeted a broad spectrum of the community, including children, the elderly, and homeless individuals. The attackers appeared to choose their victims randomly, and the methods used were particularly savage. The maniacs predominantly used blunt objects like hammers and steel construction bars, apparently to inflict maximum cruelty. The severity of the attacks left the victims unrecognizable, and in some instances, there were signs of extreme desecration. This brutal spree of the maniacs began on the night of June 25, 2007, marking the start of a nearly month-long reign of terror. Ekaterina Ilchenko, a 33-year-old woman, was attacked while returning from a friend's place 
struck unexpectedly by Saprunuk with a hammer. She was discovered by her mother early the next morning, and unfortunately, this was just the start of the horror. Within an hour, there was another discovery. Roman Tatarevich was found brutally slain. He had been sleeping on a bench, which was located right across from the local prosecutor's office. The violence escalated on July 1st, with Evgenia Grishenko and Nikolai Serchuk found slain. The string of violence continued on July 6th in Nipro, located nearby. That night, Igor Nechvaloda, a young ex-soldier, was savagely attacked on his way home. Nearby, Yelena Shram, a night guard, was ambushed by Saprunuk, who concealed a hammer beneath his shirt. Later, Valentina Hanza, a mother of three, became another victim of this senseless violence. The initial break in the case came with an attack on two boys from Peterodny on July 7, 2007. One of the boys, Vadim Lyakov, survived and escaped, later helping police to create sketches of the attackers. His testimony, combined with descriptions from other witnesses, aided law enforcement in connecting the dots between the separate incidents, which eventually led to the arrest of the maniacs. However, sadly, they were not brought to justice until July 23, 2007, two and a half weeks after this big break in the case. In the meantime, the maniacs claimed the lives of 13 more innocent people. The investigative effort was substantial, with more than 2,000 law enforcement officers involved from all over the country. However, the final breakthrough came when one of the suspects attempted to sell a cell phone belonging to one of the victims. The personal backgrounds of the three young men were explored during the investigation and subsequent trial. They had known each other since elementary school and shared some common, quote, interests that, disturbingly, evolved into torturing animals and, eventually, escalated to their violent spree. The evidence presented at trial included photographs and videos that portrayed their inhuman acts, further substantiating their guilt. Ultimately, the legal proceedings culminated on February 11th 2009, with Sapronuk and Sayenko receiving life sentences for their crimes. Hansa, who was found not to have participated directly in the violent acts, was sentenced to nine years for robberies that occurred prior to the crime. Unfortunately for the families of the victims, the videos of the crime scenes which came out at trial were leaked onto the internet and quickly went, quote, viral on shock websites. The only thing positive that can be said about this case is that the authorities seem to have acted extremely swiftly and brought down overwhelming investigative might on the maniacs. As for why they did it, well, the answer seems to be that they had a simple fascination with cruelty and senseless violence, which makes the case even more disturbing. Some individuals like the maniacs embody the purest form of evil and malevolence. Their actions, devoid of empathy and reason, challenge our understanding of human nature and confirm our deepest fears. These individuals inflicted pain and suffering without remorse. Further, the families of the victims have surely suffered from the loss of their loved ones for decades since, which sadly is likely considered a, quote, bonus by the maniacs. Their existence is a grim reminder that evil isn't just a concept, but can manifest in the real world, leading to acts that defy logic. On the other hand, the existence of such completely evil individuals does serve to remind us that the vast majority of people are fundamentally good and are disgusted by such acts. Anyway, there's a huge body of sources available on this case in both the Ukrainian and Russian languages and unfortunately, Google Translate isn't the best at these languages. I would like to do a long-form video on this case, but I would also like the opportunity to speak with someone who is familiar with one or both of these languages prior to doing so. Anyway, if this is you and you're interested in helping out, please join up in the Discord. 
The link is in the description of this video. The slaying of Carrie Lynn Nixon. In 1987, the community of Au Sable Forks, New York, was shaken by the sudden disappearance of 16-year-old Carrie Lynn Nixon. The sequence of events began on the night of June 22nd, when Carrie left her home around 9.30 p.m. to pick up groceries for her father. After making her purchases, she was observed by a neighbor close to her home around 10.05 p.m. However, within mere moments, as a group of teenagers passed by, Carrie seemed to vanish without a trace. The mysterious nature of Carrie's disappearance led to various theories and significant media attention. A bizarre twist occurred when Carrie's parents, in their relentless search for their daughter, thought they spotted her in the audience of a new Kids on the Block concert in Los Angeles. The band members, Jordan and Jonathan Knight, were moved by the family's story and made public appeals for Carrie to return home. The girl in the concert footage ultimately came forward, proving she was not the missing teen, further deepening the mystery surrounding Carrie's fate. For years, Carrie Lynn Nixon's whereabouts remained unknown, leading to speculation and countless investigations. The case saw unexpected developments when, in 1994, Robert Anthony Jones confessed to the crime as part of a plea agreement. Jones revealed he had noticed Carrie at the grocery store, followed her, and subsequently abducted her at gunpoint. He then transported her to a remote area where he committed heinous acts before ending her life. Following his confession, authorities were able to locate Carrie's remains in a shallow grave near her home, bringing this tragic case to its end. Robert Anthony Jones received a life sentence for his heinous act. However, unfortunately, he does have the possibility of being paroled. There's a popular Facebook group dedicated to the denial of his parole called Keep Carrie Nixon's Killer in Prison. So if you're on Facebook and agree that Jones shouldn't be released, you may want to consider joining this group. The Slaying of Inajiro Asanuma on October 12, 1960, Japan witnessed a shocking event that would be remembered for decades. The assassination of Inajiro Asanuma, the chairman of the Japan Socialist Party. Adding to the shock, the slaying took place during a live televised debate at Hibiya Public Hall in Tokyo. This event, perpetrated by 17-year-old Otoya Yamaguchi, a right-wing ultranationalist, highlighted the intense ideological divisions within the country during the Cold War era. Inajiro Asanuma was a controversial figure, known for his outspoken support of socialism and his opposition to Japan's security treaty with the United States. He advocated for closer ties with the People's Republic of China during a visit to Beijing in 1959. Asanuma's radical stance made him a target for right-wing groups who viewed his policies as a threat to the traditional Japanese way of life and the imperial system. Yamaguchi, who belonged to a right-wing nationalist group, saw Asanuma's actions and statements as unforgivable betrayals of Japan's national interests. On the day of the assassination, Yamaguchi infiltrated a large crowd at the debate armed with a wakizashi, a form of Japanese short sword often mistaken for a katana. His attack on a Sanuma was swift and fatal, striking him in the left side and causing internal bleeding that led to a Sanuma's death within minutes. The slaying was not only a tragic moment, but also a spectacle that was broadcast to millions, leaving an indelible mark on the national consciousness. The aftermath of Asanuma's assassination was tumultuous. The incident sparked massive protests, with thousands taking to the streets to demand accountability and express their outrage. The political crisis threatened to destabilize the government, prompting then Prime Minister Ikeda to deliver a glowing memorial speech despite political differences. Despite this, Yamaguchi's act was not without its supporters. He became a martyr to some right-wing groups who viewed his actions as a heroic defense of traditional Japanese values. 
Yamaguchi's imprisonment and subsequent self-ending three weeks after the slaying added another layer of complexity to the tragedy. His final note, written with toothpaste on his cell wall, expressed a fanatical devotion to the emperor and a willingness to sacrifice his life for his country. There's significant speculation that Yamaguchi didn't act alone and that he may have been part of a broader ultra-nationalist conspiracy theory. Yamaguchi vehemently denied acting in concert with a group. However, the truth of the matter died with him. I suspect that ultra-nationalist groups were heavily infiltrated by law enforcement officers during the time period in question. If Yamaguchi was acting in concert as part of a larger conspiracy, I suspect the conspirators would have been at best a small group. Further, while the Japanese socialist movement withered following this slaying, I would imagine that more senior ultra-nationalists were acutely aware of the risk of the opposite. This slaying could have very easily bolstered the resolve of the socialist movement in Japan. That said, a 17-year-old hyped up on nationalist fervor was unlikely to consider this. As such, I'm of the opinion that Yamaguchi most likely did act alone, unless the alternative theory discussed below is true. There's another theory floating around that the entire thing was orchestrated by a foreign three-letter intelligence service that was concerned about Asanuma's pro-China stance. The slaying of Lucy Blackman. In July 2000, 21-year-old Lucy Blackman, a British national with a deep appreciation for Japanese culture, moved to Tokyo in search of adventure. Lucy, a former flight attendant, took up employment as a hostess in Roppongi, Tokyo's party district. Hostessing in Japan often entails socializing with patrons to promote higher spending within clubs, yet it harbors risks due to the potential for unsolicited advances outside work premises. Women who work in this environment often supplement their income with paid companionship work after hours if you catch my drift. However, there is no conclusive evidence to indicate that Lucy was engaging in this kind of work, and even if she was, this is obviously absolutely no justification for what happened to her. Lucy's disappearance on July 1st, 2000, led to widespread concern. Her father, Tim Blackman, promptly arrived in Tokyo to seek answers and escalate the search leveraging media attention to pressure local authorities. And seriously, I have to give Tim Blackman a massive shout out right now, because without his advocacy on behalf of his daughter, nothing would have been done at all. Despite the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department's slow start, this spotlight intensified the investigation. Notably, the Japanese authorities faced intense criticism for their failure to take Lucy's case seriously prior to media attention. Some have speculated that the police in general don't take crimes against foreigners working in the kind of business Lucy was involved in seriously. This of course has the effect of making these women prime targets for predators. The prime suspect quickly emerged, a man named Joji Obara who was born Kim Sung Jong. Obara has an interesting history. He was born in Japan to ethnic Korean parents and amassed an extremely immense fortune during the 1980s Japanese bubble economy. However, as anyone familiar with Japanese economic history will know, the bubble economy burst at the start of the 90s and Obara lost the vast majority of his wealth. Obara had been reported to the police on numerous occasions in the past for his clearly criminal actions against women. Prior police complaints against him had been overlooked, despite his lengthy history of conducting indecent assaults on women. The revelation of his crimes only surfaced following Lucy's disappearance, when authorities uncovered over 400 video recordings of his indecent attacks, which he filmed in his condo. As you'll see later in this section, sometimes we have to count our blessings that criminals can be extremely stupid. Obara would lure women back to his condominium, and then when they were there, he would give them a drink laced with sedatives. Also, as an aside, J. 
Joji Obara will be featured on an upcoming episode of this series, since the horrors of his crimes are, for lack of a better term, an entire rabbit hole. Despite initial setbacks, the case against Obara progressed. He was arrested following the link between his contact with Lucy and corroborative testimonies from other victims. However, his trial was marked by challenges, notably the acquittal on charges directly associated with Lucy's fate due to insufficient direct evidence. Despite being legally not guilty of the actions, a friend of Obara paid £450,000 to Lucy's father on behalf of Obara, because that's what innocent people do, right? But yes, I'm required to say this here. The allegations against Obara with respect to Lucy Blackman were not proven, and he is legally speaking not guilty. I will strongly encourage you to draw your own conclusions from the facts as presented, and the facts of the case generally. And remember when I said we should be thankful that Obara recorded the commission of many of his crimes? Well, he wasn't able to escape the law. Obara faced justice and was convicted of multiple SA incidents and the manslaughter of another victim, Carita Ridgeway. He spent years appealing these decisions. However, in 2012, his appeals were rejected by the Japanese Supreme Court. Obara is now in prison for life and will be unable to victimize any women further. The Lucy Blackman Trust was established in the wake of this tragedy, focusing on advocating for young women who have gone missing abroad. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please do me a favor and hit the like and subscribe buttons and slap that sweet notification bell. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership or the Patreon and joining the Discord community. The YouTube and Patreon memberships allow me to engage in less self-censorship. After all, your support can free me from concerns about demonetization. And trust me, when you hit on the sort of topics I hit on demonetization is always a very real concern. Also, the Discord community is super active now, so if you've been on the fence about joining up, now's the time. The Frankfurt Slasher The Frankfurt Slasher's case, running from 1985 to 1990 in the Frankfurt neighborhood of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, remains a largely unsolved serial slaying. This period saw the tragic end of eight to nine individuals, all of whom suffered a violent demise. Leonard Christopher, who was convicted for one of these crimes, has been a central figure in discussions, though he's been dubbed a copycat killer by police. The victims shared certain characteristics. They were women living on the societal margins, many with backgrounds of mental health issues or substance dependency. The investigation revealed a pattern of assault and a methodical manner in which the victims were left. Most of the victims frequented Goldie's Bar, a local establishment, which emerged as a critical link in understanding the perpetrator's hunting ground. This bar was a noted hangout for women who engaged in the practice of paid companionship, so the full nature of the connection to the bar is unknown. Police efforts to solve the case were marred by controversy and criticism, with some accusing the police of attempting to sweep the slayings under the rug. Early on, there was hesitation in linking the crimes, and when connections were finally acknowledged, the focus on Leonard Christopher drew scrutiny. The reason for this scrutiny was simple. Christopher was black, and all evidence pointed toward the Slayer being a white middle-aged male. Despite the conviction of Christopher for one slaying, it is now widely believed that the real perpetrator remained at large. Given the socioeconomic status of the victims and the lack of attention on this case, unfortunately I have my doubts as to whether this will ever be solved. Unfortunately, this is the reason serial slayers seem to target women at the bottom of this industry. These predators know that many people engaging in paid companionship on the street level will have no one to advocate for them when they're gone. Further, they know that the police will, with a great degree of certainty, 
not allocate appropriate resources to the case. As an aside, it's unclear to me if there are any ongoing investigations into these slayings at present. The Slaying of Tomoko Takakawa On the morning of March 10, 1959, an office worker found the body of a woman floating near the Miyashita Bridge over the Zenpakuji River in Tokyo's Suginami Ward. Dressed in a green suit, silk blouse, and white undergarments, her belongings were scattered nearby. Initially suspected of drowning due to the absence of visible injuries in her missing shoes, an autopsy later indicated she might have been strangled, evidenced by marks on her neck. Fluids from two individuals were also detected, prompting a deeper investigation into her acquaintances. The deceased was identified as Tomoko Takakawa, a 27-year-old flight attendant from Ashia City, Hyogo Prefecture. Tomoko was raised Catholic and she moved to Tokyo for nursing school before working as a nurse in Ashia and then returning to Tokyo. She transitioned careers to become a flight attendant for the British Overseas Airway Corporation, thanks to her uncle's influence in the company. Takakawa was selected from among 300 applicants and was set to commence her first flight on March 13, 1959, but she disappeared after attending a birthday party on March 8. Belgian-born Louis Charles Vermeersch, a Catholic priest, emerged as a suspect after Takekawa's notebook entries and a parcel linked him to her. Despite undergoing questioning and displaying signs of physical stress, Vermeersch denied any romantic involvement with Takekawa, stating their meeting was purely for consultation. However, police found evidence suggesting a prior relationship. Witnesses reported sightings of Vermeersch around the time of Takekawa's disappearance. Vermeersh's alibis, which were provided by church members, were met with skepticism, which may reflect a tendency towards Japanese society viewing Christians as outsiders. Just days before a scheduled police interview, Vermeersh left Japan on an Air France flight, claiming church orders and a desire to visit his aging parents. His departure left many questions unanswered, and despite never being formally charged, the cloud of suspicion never fully lifted. And as you may have been able to guess, Vermeersh never returned to Japan in any capacity. Vermeersh lived out his life in Canada, passing away in 2017 without making public comments on the case. Tomoko Takakawa's murder remains unsolved, officially closed by the police in 1974. It's unclear to me if the DNA evidence in this case was kept, However, given that the case was closed, I suspect that it may not have been. Given the evidence in this case, I think we can say a few things for certain. First, Vermeersh was almost certainly engaging in an affair with one of his parishioners, which for a number of reasons could have landed him in ecclesiastical hot water. Second, two sources of DNA were located at the crime scene. It's possible that Vermeersh may have had a rendezvous with Tomoko after which an unknown party ended her. In terms of Vermeersh leaving Japan, I note that the Japanese police aren't exactly known for their fair treatment of accused individuals. Bible John Bible John, a name that still strikes fear into the heart of Glasgow, Scotland, refers to an unidentified serial slayer linked to the deaths of three women in the late 1960s. The moniker originates from the killer's alleged quoting of the Bible during his encounters with victims, leading to a media frenzy and a manhunt. The only link between the slayings was a nightclub called the Barrowland Ballroom and the description of a well-spoken, smartly dressed man given by witnesses. Patricia Docker, a 25-year-old nursing auxiliary, was the first victim, last seen alive on February 23rd 1968. Her body was discovered the following morning, not far from her home, hidden from view. She had met her end by way of strangling. The second victim, Jemima McDonald, a 32-year-old mother of three, met a similar fate after a night at the Barrowland on August 16, 1969. 
Her disappearance sparked rumors among the local community, leading to the grim discovery of her body in an abandoned building. Like Patricia, Jemima had been strangled. The final known victim, Helen Putock, also 29, attended the Barrowland Ballroom on October 31, 1969. Helen's body was found the next day in the backyard of her apartment. The witness account from her sister, who had shared a taxi with Helen and the mysterious man, provided the most detailed description of the suspect, who would come to be known as Bible John. Over the years, several suspects have been considered, with one of the most notable being Peter Tobin. Tobin, a convicted serial killer, came into focus due to similarities between his known crimes and the Bible John slayings. Further, he allegedly had a presence in Glasgow at the time of the killings and does bear a resemblance to the composite sketches of the suspect. However, conclusive evidence linking Tobin to the Bible John slayings has never been found and may never be due to improper storage of DNA evidence from the slayings. Further, the police no longer consider him a suspect and have since come to have doubts that he actually lived in Glasgow at the time of the slayings. This is largely due to evidence of Tobin's wife, who has cooperated with police in relation to Tobin's crimes and denied his presence there at the time. Numerous other suspects have been considered, but all major candidates for Bible John have been cleared by the authorities. William Unick William Unek was a figure whose life took a dark turn, culminating in two separate tragic events that shook the communities he targeted. Born around 1929, Unek was a police constable prior to turning to evil. In 1954, in the Belgian Congo, Unek was responsible for the loss of 21 lives in a horrific spree. The details of this event are scant, but it was reported that he used an axe chopping at his victims indiscriminately. The reasons behind this act remain unclear, with no motive fully ascertained. After this spree, Unek fled, eventually making his way to Tanganyika, modern Tanzania, blending into a new environment under a false identity. Three years later, in early 1957, Unek initiated another spree in the area of Malampaka, using a stolen police rifle, among other weapons. This time, his actions resulted in the deaths of 36 individuals, including men, women, and children. The brutality of these acts was unimaginable, with Unek employing a range of methods to carry out his attacks, including shooting, stabbing, burning, and strangling. Among the victims was reportedly his own wife, whom he killed before setting their home on fire. The aftermath of the second spree led to Tanganyika's largest manhunt at the time, involving local tribesmen, police, and the King's African rifles. Despite the use of dogs and aircraft in the search, Unek evaded capture for nine days. He was eventually located due to the bravery of a local resident. Unek showed up at the home of Iyumbu Benikumbu, who distracted Unek with food, drink, and conversation while his wife was sent to notify the police. Upon their arrival, a shootout ensued, and Unek was mortally wounded. Personally, I question whether anyone involved felt too much incentive to take this guy alive. Iyumbu Benikumbu, recognized for his bravery, received a large financial reward and received the British Empire Medal for Meritorious Service in light of his actions. The cause of William Unick's two sprees is entirely unknown, and unfortunately the case is poorly documented. Further, it's unclear how many victims Unick may have had in total, given the three years between his two rampages. I suspect that there were additional victims in the interim, but again, I simply don't have access to the necessary records. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also, check out the Patreon and the YouTube membership. Your support allows me to take on more difficult topics that risk demonetization.
Shout out to my patrons, Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, z -Volts, Director Delta, and Unknown Delusions. Also, big shout out to YouTube members Jordan All and Syntax Nexus. Also to every viewer and listener, I love you a ton and you make this all possible. I'm not exaggerating when I say that without you this channel wouldn't exist. And don't forget to join the Discord channel to chat and interact with myself and other members of the community in real time. Click the link in the description. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone.